I believe everyone is in. I see there are 52 attendees. Um, I'm not sure if they're in and observing right now or if I, but I have no option to let anyone in. So I don't believe that there's a waiting room. Oh, yep. We got people talking in the chat. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful night in Pennsylvania. It's great that you're taking some time out when it's so lovely outside to, to join us for this event. My name is Mark Steer, and I'm the director of the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. I want to welcome you to our symposium on, a th on threats to the Pennsylvania Constitution. The Constitution of Pennsylvania, like that of the United States, was designed to ensure our future as a republic, or in James Madison's words, a government in which all power comes directly or indirectly from the people. The separation of powers and checks and balances were designed to block an accumulation of power in the hands of any one body of government, and the use of that power to undermine the rule of law and our representative democracy. Recently, members of the General Assembly have been putting forward a series of constitutional amendments that in dramatic ways would change how we choose legislators and justices and justices in our appellate, justices and judges in our appellate courts, as well as change the balance of power between the different branches of government. Over 45 constitutional amendments have been proposed in the current session of the General Assembly. You saw many of them scroll by you as you were waiting. This symposium will consider these proposed constitutional amendments and the process by which we amend the Constitution in Pennsylvania and ask whether they enhance or threaten the Republican character of the government of Pennsylvania. This event has been developed and is being hosted by Common Cause Pennsylvania, led by Khalif Ali, the New Pennsylvania Project, led by Kadita Kenner, Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, led by Deborah Gross, my organization, the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center, and the Judicial Independence Project of Pennsylvania, which we all lead. We invite you to put your name and where you live in the chat box and get to know that chat box because we plan to have time for your questions after the initial presentations by our panelists and a discussion among them. So please use the Zoom chat function to put your questions there and Deborah Gross of Pennsylvanians from Modern Courts will read them to our panelists. Now it's my great pleasure to turn the program over to my friend, Kadita Kenner, the executive director of the New Pennsylvania Project, who will introduce our moderator. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to tonight's moderator. And I must say that the month of April has been good to all Judge Jacksons. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator this evening, the Honorable Frederica Messiah Jackson was elected to the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas in 1983. She presided over medical malpractice and products liability cases, complex commercial litigation, and personal injury matters. A graduate of Chestnut Hill College and the University of Pennsylvania Law School, the judge uh, practiced corporate and civil litigation with the law firm Blank Rome before advancing to the bench. She also worked with the Senate of Pennsylvania as Chief Counsel for the Senate Insurance and Business Committee. Judge Messiah Jackson was a lecturer at the Wharton School of uh, Business of the University of Pennsylvania from 1992 to 2002, where she taught legal studies and business law. She was the first African-American female judge to preside in civil jury trials in the Philadelphia's courts. Judge Messiah Jackson was elected as the first African-American president judge of any county in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia. During her years as president judge from 2001 to 2006, the first judicial district administered justice with a $110 million overall budget, 2,500 employees and 130 judges. She is a member and past president of the Delaware Valley, Pennsylvania chapter of the Lynx Incorporated and is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. The now retired judge is the proud mother of Dr. Julia L. Jackson and Thomas H. Jackson IV. Please welcome <laughs> tonight's moderator, Judge Frederica Messiah Jackson. Thank you, thank you, Kadita. <laughs> thank you. And welcome to our audience this evening. As you know, people all over the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania are concerned about what we call a time of crisis. And that's why we're here this evening. Each of us as citizens and residents of Pennsylvania have an interest and a right 
to meaningfully participate in our institutions. And so of course we all know that that means a right to vote. But the reason we're here tonight is because it also means that the public's voice must be heard. You, the audience, have a right to know how and when and what changes are being considered within our state government. We call that transparency. All of the sponsors of the forum believe in each of our three branches of government. And you're gonna hear this several times. We've already heard from Mark and you're gonna hear this again. We believe in three branches of government. They're co-equal branches. They share power and no one branch is more equal or more powerful than the other branches. So to challenge and to crisis and to threat that brings us together and brings the esteemed panel of thought leaders together is that since January, 2021, only 16 months ago, the Pennsylvania State Legislature has proposed more than 70 challenges and changes to our state constitution, 7-0. However, there's been very little public comment, very little public notice. So I'm going to introduce you to each of our three panel members. Each professor will speak for about 10 or so minutes. And then we're gonna transition into a conversation and discussion among the panel members. If anyone in the audience has a question, please type it and put it in the chat. And toward the end of the program, we'll, we'll see how our time is and we'll try to address the questions. So first, and, and I'm gonna ask each professor to kind of wave when I say your name, okay. First, we will hear from Professor Craig Green. Professor Green received his law degree from Yale University and his master's and PhD in history from Princeton. He has been teaching at Temple University's Beasley School of Law since 2004. He's received numerous awards and recognitions for outstanding scholarship and distinguished teaching. His current research involves federalism, separation of powers of the three branches of government, Native American territory, and constitutional history. Before joining the law school faculty, Professor Green worked at the U.S. Department of Justice handling appellate research and appellate litigation. He served as a law clerk for Judge Merrick Garland, who's currently the U.S. Attorney General. But at that time, Judge Garland was a circuit judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Professor Green also served as a law clerk in Philadelphia for the late Judge Lou Pollock of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. In October, 2021, the Boston University Law Review published Dr. Green's comprehensive and stunning, and I say stunning article, which describes conservative judicial activism whose goals are to invalidate years of legal precedent through constitutional reinterpretation. Professor Green describes the impact on laws involving immigration, civil rights, trade and tariffs, and national security. His article is titled, Deconstructing the Administrative State, Transformation of Constitutional Politics. And for those who read law review journals, this is a powerful work. It's, it's amazing. Our, now, our second speaker will be Professor Bruce Ledowitz. Professor Ledowitz is a professor of law and holds the Adrian Van Cam Endowed Chair of Scholarly Excellence at Duquesne University's Law School in Pittsburgh. He received his law degree from Yale University and his undergraduate degree from Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Professor Ledowitz specializes in law and religion, jurisprudence, and Pennsylvania and federal constitutional law. He's the author of four books. He has a weekly column 
and is a regular op-ed contributor to the Pennsylvania Capital Star, which is a nonprofit and nonpartisan news site. He comments on state government, politics, and policy. And he also writes his own blog. It's called Hallowed Secularism, covering a variety of legal and religious topics. Professor Lederwitz has expressed strong opinions and concerns about the breakdown in public discourse, about the spiritual crisis and loss of values in American law. He questions whether the rule of law can be sustained in our constitutional democracy. Professor Lederwitz has a new book, which was recently published entitled, The Universe is on Our Side, Restoring Faith in American Public Life. This book brings together his deep interest in both religion and the law. Professor Lederwitz commented at a program that I watched recently that an early title for this book was The Future of Law in the Time of the Death of God. Well, the title has shifted from the death of God to the universe is on our side. But the writing itself reflects clear-sighted analysis about whether or not we can have a coherent universe and sustain the rule of law. Our third speaker will be Professor Rogers Smith. Okay, Professor. Professor Smith has been a distinguished professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania since 2001. And before that, he was a tenured political uh, science professor at Yale University for more than 20 years. He received his undergraduate degree from James Madison College within Michigan State University. And then the professor did postgraduate studies at Michigan State and at the University of Kent in England. Dr. Smith obtained his master's degree and his PhD in government from Harvard University. He is especially known as a constitutional and political scholar, focusing on racial, gender, and class inequalities. The professor is the author of at least eight books and many, many scholarly articles on American political ideology, citizenship, civil rights, identity politics, immigration, populist movements, and the ongoing political and class struggles in this country. Professor Smith's book titled Civic Ideals, Conflicting Visions of Citizenship was a finalist for the 1998 Pulitzer Prize in history. And he's continued to write about what he calls America's case of mistaken identity. He has explained that in many, he has explained in many articles over years that the American vision of exceptionalism is actually linked to historic US policies and practices designed to preserve systems of white supremacy and to perceive superiority of white identity. The professor's most recent book published in 2020 is titled, That is Not Who We Are, Populism and Peoplehood. He writes that stories about individuals expressing core values are an effective counterpoint to narrow reactionary and nationalistic identities. Professor Smith argues that we the people, that's peoplehood, possess an underlying unity and a common connection. We can develop constructive and positive responses to partisanship and class conflicts. So I think our audience can understand <coughs> that each speaker comes from a, a, <clears throat> a different perspective and different orientation, excuse me. Each speaker is going to take up the current challenges and threats to our Pennsylvania Constitution. So, <clears throat> Professor Green, what exactly is a constitution? And where does Pennsylvania's constitution come from? Thank you so much for that uh, really tremendous introduction. Of course, it's such an honor 
for me to share the stage in this Zoom kind of world uh, with you and also uh, with professors uh, Ledowitz and uh, Smith, who are national experts in state and federal constitutions. And I think uh, to start with this question, the technological thing, I'm going to use some uh, pictures, uh, but they're only going to be as big as my head. Uh, so I think that if somebody needs to adjust their Zoom uh, to make it bigger, I, I thought it, but I think this idea of thinking about what a constitution is, and just like you say, thinking about what the federal and Pennsylvania constitutions, how they're similar and different, and in some ways set the stage for a more detailed discussion, I think, coming down the line. And so uh, just to start with that very first question of uh, what is a constitution, you know, uh, hundreds of countries have written constitutions, uh, but not everyone does. And so, for example, the United Kingdom did not in 1776 and still does not today. And what's the point of having a constitution anyway? There are at least two major reasons, I think, that constitutions exist and what they are thought to accomplish. And one of them is to uh, set the stage for the structure of government. You know, uh, people in states and in the country and around the world fight about politics. But the Constitution sets up the framework for how those fights happen. Uh, creates a legislature, creates, for example, a governor or a president, uh, creates, as Judge Messiah Jackson mentioned, the three branches of government. Um, that framework is one thing that a constitution is thought to accomplish. And a second thing, which may be more familiar to folks, is thinking about fundamental rights. These are thought to be individual rights, for example, that are really removed and sheltered from politics. They're not the kind of things that uh, people put to a vote every day. Fundamental rights like speech or religion or equality. These are the kinds of things that just to set the stage a little bit that a constitution or constitutions are thought to accomplish. So, you know, in my law school classes or whatever you have it, you know, I, I uh, show uh, this kind of slide uh, to illustrate the uh, supremacy of constitutional law, but also its narrowness. So all kinds of other laws are uh, below that, but constitutional law is the, is the, the most important one in some kind of a way. And you know what is it that makes the Constitution special or constitutional law special? Uh, what is it that takes it outside of the realm of ordinary political fights and struggles over tax rates or whatever you want? Um, the idea is that a Constitution is suppo supposed to be hard to change uh, in one way uh, or another, harder to change than ordinary legislation. Fine. So the second question you asked about comparing uh, the federal Constitution uh, to the state constitution. Uh, we'll start with the federal one. The federal constitution is extremely hard to amend. Um, it requires, uh, as many of you know, requires a two thirds vote in each house, not just in the Senate where the filibuster blocks a lot of stuff anyway, uh, but also two thirds in the house. Uh, extraordinarily daunting uh, sort of prospect, uh, the, the, the two thirds in each house. And then the other thing it requires is once that's accomplished, it requires approval of three quarters of the states. Uh, and so this is a real characteristic of federal constitutional law. One of the reasons it is so immensely foundational and very, very hard to change. There's a lot of historical stories to tell about that. Um, you know, there, there have been 27 amendments of all time and only eight in the last hundred years. Now, the hardness of changing, the difficulty of changing the federal constitution contributes to its fundamental role in American politics. It's why a lot of people view the federal constitution as such an important, for some people even almost a sacred uh, feature of American political life. It's there to stay and it takes things really again outside the realm of ordinary politics, the existence of three branches, uh, individual rights and the rest. So, uh, but the Pennsylvania constitution is different from that to sort of compare uh, to the Pennsylvania constitution. Uh, there have been five versions of the uh, Pennsylvania Constitution, major versions over time. The very first Constitution, 1776, there was not a governor, and that was thought to be one really big uh, problem with it. Well, another thing that's true is the first two Constitutions, 1776, 1790, they didn't allow constitutional amendments at all. If you wanted to change the Constitution under that system, you had to get a whole convention to effectively rewrite the whole thing. And so it was very, very hard to change. Into that. But for a long, long time, 
uh, Pennsylvania's constitution has had a consistent amendment procedure, which I don't know, is it easy to amend? It's a lot easier to amend. I think that's the right thing to say, a lot easier to amend than the federal constitution. What you have to do to amend it is you have to have it passed by two general assemblies. So uh, as a constitutional amendment, doesn't have to be approved by the governor, can't be vetoed by the governor. It really is a tool of the general assembly. And then once that happens, uh, there has to be popular approval uh, as a ballot measure uh, in the voting booth. But that can happen at any number of elections. So it could happen at a big election where lots of people go to the polls, or it could happen even at a primary election where very, very few people go to the polls. I think that'll be important for later discussions about the democratic character or flaws in the Pennsylvania constitutional amendments. Fine. So relatively easy to amend. Uh, dozens of amendments over time and you know almost one a year if you spread it out uh, over the last uh, uh, 50 years what a contrast there is in that way from the federal uh, constitutional uh, system so uh you know what does this all mean <laughs> what does this all kind of have to do with stuff and i i think uh, one way to think about it is um you know the um the pennsylvania constitution is so different and the pennsylvania constitution the ability to make really big changes um, through a relatively easy political set of mechanisms, doesn't it kind of almost call into question if there were a lot of changes made relatively quickly, why even have a constitution in the first place? If it's true that constitutional law is not taking things outside of the realm of ordinary politics, but if the constitution is being changed pretty regularly for more or less the same sort of things, that other statutes are passed for in ordinary politics. I think it really does have in some, I don't know, broader theoretical kind of way, a challenge to the idea of having a constitution, but it's not all theory. It's not all theory. So I think if you think about, um, you know, uh, it is true that a constitutional amendment, a Pennsylvania constitutional amendment could do anything, um, really almost anything. Uh, and especially when you think of what Judge Masai Jackson was talking about, the three branches of government, the General Assembly could use its power to amend the Constitution in this relatively easy way to significantly weaken or even, I mean, even in extreme case, they might even be able to abolish the governor. They certainly, I think there is an amendment to try to abolish the lieutenant governor. Uh, or they could try to abolish the courts. Now, they haven't tried to abolish the courts. They have various uh, tools of trying to weaken the courts. But there really isn't a clear limit on what could be accomplished through constitutional amendments. And those kinds of amendments, really dramatic changes, especially concerning the other branches of government, I think are especially troublesome if you think about it in terms of the constitution stability, how the Pennsylvania government is supposed to work. Now, uh, maybe it's right to say, uh, you know, I'm a person just like everybody else. Uh, there are certain constitutional amendments that as a matter of personal politics, maybe I don't favor, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, I think the thing I'd like to talk about are things that really the tool, the instrument of using the constitutional amendment to accomplish that goal, whether I agree with it or don't agree with it, um, where I think it raises special kind of troubles. And the one side of things, you make dramatic changes relatively easily, that's, that's problematic, I think, weakening other branches. But I mentioned before, I think it really starts to burn a little bit when you think about doing these things in primary elections where very, very few people might even turn out to vote. And there's very little attention paid to the issues that are there. So here, this mechanism is creating this foundational law that's, uh, you know, uh, going to restructure Pennsylvania's government. And very few people are even participating uh, in those kinds of elections. And one reason, of course, a, a lot of uh, Pennsylvania's constitutional amendments, really a large number, um, get approved relatively routinely. So if you ask me on this institutional side, putting aside personal politics, as a matter of institutional mechanism, I have to say that, you know, the most immediate thing that I guess I think um, would be great is uh, to amend the amendment process at least to make sure that the approval as a ballot measure happened in what we think to be major elections, 
you know, when other major offices are being debated and when political folks can have debates about whether to approve or not approve a particular constitutional amendment. The idea of these things being done in very low attendance, minor elections, I think is a really, really troublesome thing. But I put this solution in quotation marks because another big problem that's running through this whole thing is that every amendment is being proposed by the General Assembly that likes to use its power to issue constitutional amendments. So it really would take in some ways the people to rise up and ask for this restructuring, require demand that their General Assembly make this change that would weaken the General Assembly in some kind of way. It's hard to imagine it in some kind of uh, schemes of the politics. So I guess the last message is I'm just, I've said before, I'm extremely pleased and honored to be here uh, with Judge Messiah Jackson and the other panelists. But actually, I'm also really pleased about this program itself and the audience, uh, you folks who have indeed come out, because I think information and attention from the public are the most immediate safeguards that anybody can have or count on to solve some of the problems that we confront. And therefore, I think it's, you know, it's maybe it's a happy note to end on. I think in some sense, uh, even by being uh, on this Zoom call or, uh, or watching in some other venue, I think there's a sense in which um, every person here could be part of the solution, calling attention to this, uh, this very, very peculiar set of uh, institutional arrangements and the, and the threats to the separation of powers in other parts of Pennsylvania government that I think might be in prospect. Thanks very much. Jackson, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Green. Thank you. Professor Ledowitz, you well, are the co director of Duquesne Law School's PA Constitution website. So, what are your thoughts about this recent amendment process in Pennsylvania? And is this a traditional way to operate government? What's the effect? What do you think about it? Well, first, I, I want to echo Professor Green's um, acknowledgement of this uh, excellent panel. I'm very pleased to be a part of. And any discussion, really, of the Pennsylvania Constitution, which has been a subject of mine for many years and a, a subject that Duquesne Law School takes very seriously. and. Um, our uh, president of, of Duquesne University actually has, has written a, a book about the Pennsylvania Constitution, Ken Gormley. So it's a, a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank the uh, organizers of this event. Um, as Professor Green explained, the process by which amendments can be proposed to Pennsylvania's Constitution is comparatively undemanding. Unlike the federal Constitution, which requires a two-thirds vote in each house in order to propose an amendment, Pennsylvania only requires a majority vote in each house in two succeeding legislative sessions. So there's no super majority requirement. The result is that it's much easier to propose a constitutional amendment in Pennsylvania than at the federal level. In addition, to actually adopt an amendment once one is proposed, the US Constitution requires that the legislatures of three fourths of the states ratify it. That's 38 states. To get a sense of how difficult that is, Consider that in 2016, Donald Trump won 30 states and Hillary Clinton won 20. So a federal constitutional amendment has to have real consensus behind it to be adopted. It has to appeal to red and blue states. In contrast, the adoption of an amendment in Pennsylvania requires only a simple majority vote in a referendum at an election. And that election can take place even in a low turnout context like a primary making adoption of an amendment even easier to achieve. The result of this difference is not surprising since the approval of the current version of the Pennsylvania Constitution in 1968, 49 amendments have been adopted. Voters have rejected only six proposed amendments during that same period. In contrast, in the entire history of, of the US Constitution, that is since 1788, only 27 amendments have been adopted. Now, the question is about the ease of amendment and whether this is a defect. Uh, I do not think it is a defect. It simply represents a different view of what a constitution is 
from the difficult to amend US Constitution. Through the amendment process, the people of Pennsylvania have been able to control the judicial and executive branches of government much more easily than the American people can control those branches of the federal government. Thus, since 1968, the people of Pennsylvania have adopted amendments changing the structure of the executive branch in various ways, creating an elected attorney general, for example, in 1980, and overturning several Pennsylvania Supreme Court decisions. Now, because the legislature has the authority to propose constitutional amendments, it is no surprise that fewer amendments have been adopted limiting its authority. However, even in this context, in 1981, a legislative apportionment commission was created through a constitutional amendment, thus limiting the power of the General Assembly to draw those districts. In addition to controlling the government, the ease of the amendment process has allowed the people of Pennsylvania to insert fundamental political commitments into the constitution, including a prohibition on discrimination based on gender and a protection of the environment unique among the states and federal government. This healthy democratic use of the amendment power continues to this day. Thus at the primary election on May 18th, 2021, the people of Pennsylvania adopted amendments prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race and reversing a divided Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision that had subjected a legislative resolution ending an emergency declaration to a gubernatorial veto. Although obviously controversial and many would feel threatening to privacy rights, Senate Bill 956, which proposes a constitutional amendment that would prohibit the recognition of a constitutional right to choose abortion by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, should Roe versus Wade be overturned, continues this approach. If adopted, abortion would be regulated by the General Assembly rather than being the subject of state constitutional litigation. None of this represents a flaw in governance, even though many people may disagree with some of these outcomes. Unfortunately, in the polarized political environment that currently exists, both nationally and in Pennsylvania as well, the constitutional amendment process has begun to warp and now threatens to undermine the basic structure of the Pennsylvania Constitution. This is occurring in two ways. First, and, and, and really a more technical problem, the inability of the Wolf administration and the Republican majority in the General Assembly to reach compromises on a wide range of issues is leading to the use of the amendment process to place what are essentially statutes into the text of the Pennsylvania Constitution. This is happening because while a Pennsylvania governor can veto proposed statutory changes, requiring a usually unattainable two thirds vote in each house to reverse the veto, the governor cannot veto a proposed constitutional amendment. Pennsylvania's legislative leadership now considers amendment of the constitution a way around the governor's veto power. Thus at that same May 2021 primary election, the voters adopted a new emergency declaration provision that is nothing more than an amendment to the current statute. This distortion of the amendment process is not only cumbersome, it means that needed changes in the law of emergency declarations in the future will be difficult to enact since they will require both a repeal of a constitutional provision and only then a statutory change. Hopefully legislative leaders will come to their senses and realize that you cannot successfully legislate by amendment. Or the voters will come to see and reject future statute-like constitutional amendments. The second problem is more serious. The General Assembly is now considering various changes to Pennsylvania's structure of government that would shift power to the legislative branch and create a system without effective checks on the legislative power in contravention of the fundamental principles of American constitutional government. Thus, there are now proposals for amendments 
that would change the process of electing Pennsylvania's appellate courts from at-large elections to district elections. This change would not only permit political gerrymandering of those districts by the General Assembly, but would remove the authority of the people of Pennsylvania as a whole to decide on the makeup of the courts. Such a change would also threaten the rule of law by suggesting that geographical and other interests should control state constitutional interpretation. The content of the Pennsylvania Constitution should not depend on where a justice resides or even where the voters reside. Similarly, there is a proposed constitutional amendment to bring the legislative districting process back to the General Assembly. This change would allow greater manipulation in drawing those districts. There are also a number of proposed amendments that would limit the authority of the executive branch to issue rules, regulations, and executive orders and create authority in the General Assembly to veto administrative decisions without a corresponding veto power in the governor. Finally, there are proposals that would effectively remove the rulemaking power from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and presumably place it in the General Assembly. Individually, each of these proposals could be debated and undoubtedly each has some merit. But when looked at as a whole, they reflect a worrying tendency to amass power in the General Assembly to the detriment of the principle of checks and balances. These changes are being pursued largely for short-term partisan advantage. The problem is they threaten long-term structural damage to the Pennsylvania Constitution that will be difficult to overcome. The only current hope for thwarting this tendency to legislative aggrandizement is either election of more moderate and less partisan legislators, or a decision by the people of Pennsylvania to reject constitutional amendments much more frequently, which would probably end the overuse of the amendment process. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Letowitz. Very, very well put. And that's a good segue for Professor Roger Smith you, you have uh, referred to the amendments and the voting process as referendums. So what, are, what do you consider are the implications for the deliberate efforts, what appear to be deliberate efforts of, uh, by the legislature to have the people vote in the low turnout elections, you know, the primaries rather than the November? What, what do you see there? Uh, well, thank you, Judge Messiah Jackson, and my thanks to everyone involved for including me in this timely discussion of topics that are more central to the whole American system of constitutional self-governance than we sometimes recognize. As background for the question, let me say that because today the practice of relying on written constitutions has spread around the world, most Americans probably don't know that America's revolutionary generation was the first in world history to create written constitutions, to empower and to limit their state governments and national governments. They did so chiefly because they felt the distant imperial government in London had violated their rights and their powers of self-governance under the unwritten British constitution, really just a set of statutes, practices, and conventions. They wanted to put people's rights and government structures and powers in writing to make them harder to violate at both the state and national levels. What we also often don't realize is the relationship that America has developed between state and national constitutions. As you've heard, our state constitutions are easier to change than our national constitution, and we do change them much more often. As of 2020, 11,969 national constitutional amendments had been formally proposed in US history, but only 27 have been ratified. And in contrast, a slightly smaller number, 
11,635 amendments had been proposed to state constitutions throughout the country, but 7,695 of those had been ratified. One big reason is that although over the course of U.S. history, the federal government has come to play a much larger role in our national life than it did originally, we still deal with a huge number of issues at the state level, often through state constitutional changes. That's why our state constitutions not only change more often than the U.S. Constitution, they're on average five times longer than the U.S. Constitution, which is 7,591 words long. Pennsylvania's state constitution is a bit under 37,000 words, and so it's typical in length. And by the way, the Alabama constitution is 388,882 words, probably the longest in the world. Now, the political scientist Robinson Woodward Burns has argued that these huge differences between state constitutions and the national constitution are not accidental, and that they are in some ways beneficial. Our national constitution is stable, as Professor Green emphasized, in part because we resolve many important issues at the state level through state constitutional changes. The states can resolve those issues in sometimes slightly different, sometimes substantially different ways, responding to the differing desires of their citizens. Often this saves us from trying to have one national answer that is imposed on everyone in ways that can often stir resentment against the national government. It's true that the different policies of the states can also be sources of conflict, but often as parts of a nation committed to freedom for all, the states find ways to live and let live. States make their frequent constitutional changes in lots of different ways, but as you've heard, here in Pennsylvania, we most often do it through a popular referendum on amendments proposed to the people by the legislature. In recent years, many political scientists have studied referendums as means of democratic decision-making, and their findings have some important lessons for our state's amendment processes. At their best, referendums have real virtues. They can spark widespread debate and deliberation among the citizens about the directions in which we want our state to go. And when they do, they tend to produce outcomes, policies that are more in line with the views of the majority of citizens than those that legislatures often produce. So referendums can make decision-making more truly democratic and they can make democratic decision-making more deliberative and better informed. That's at their best. But sometimes referendums can be very poor mechanisms of democratic decision-making. Scholars have identified a whole set of things that can go wrong with referendums. First, especially because they often deal with complicated issues, their wording can be very unclear, confusing, and mis misleading, so voters don't really know what they're voting for. Second, if a referendum involves a long list of items, like many constitutional amendments at once, it can be just too much for voters to absorb. So they make uninformed choices or don't vote at all. Third, as Professor Green noted and in response to your question, if a referendum is part of a low turnout election, a low turnout primary or general election, then the intense preferences of a small minority of voters who actually disagree with the majority, but who do turn out and vote to a much greater extent, their views may well prevail. Fourth, especially in those low turnout elections, money can be especially influential in shaping voters' ideas about the issue, as well as shaping voter turnout, so that the referendum doesn't reflect which side's view is more popular as much as it does which side is richer. Fifth, even if a referendum is part of a high turnout election, in these polarized times, voters may not actually think about the issue the referendum is addressing, but only about which party is favoring it. Now, no democratic process is perfect. And again, despite these problems, referendums can work well as mechanisms of democratic decision-making. But we have to worry about these problems here in Pennsylvania because our legislature seems to be get, getting ready to send a large number of amendments to us to vote on all at once, including in low turnout primary elections. And 
during a highly polarized time when voters often feel pressured just to think about what party is for a constitutional amendment rather than whether the amendment itself is a good idea. Finally, I have to note that when we recognize how polarized partisan politics can damage democratic decision-making on constitutional amendments, we have to acknowledge honestly that many of our recent proposals for constitutional amendments here in Pennsylvania, uh, including many of those that Professor Ledowitz discussed so well, many of these proposals are part of an intense nationwide partisan struggle over how to structure our governing institutions to favor the success of one party or the other. In particular, Republicans have feared for three decades that the changing demographics of the nation are increasing the percentages of Democratic voters in the electorate, statewide and nationwide, believing that their party nonetheless represents what's best for the nation. They are restructuring rules governing who can vote, who administers elections, whether elections are done by districts or statewide, who does the districting, and what the powers of officials elected by districts, like the legislators, are versus the powers of those elected statewide, like the governor. They're doing this so that Republican-leaning voters are more likely to be able to vote than Democratic-leaning voters and so that officials elected from districts drawn to be favorable to Republicans will have more power than officials elected statewide or even the nonpartisan officials. Now, of course, the Democrats in Pennsylvania and elsewhere often have similar goals, but they're not in control of the state legislature here, so they are not driving the amendment processes or scheduling the referendums. Now, all this has a long history and it's been accelerating since the Democrats under Bill Clinton passed the so-called Motor Voter Bill in 1993, making it easier for people to register to vote when they got driver's licenses. Republicans have since claimed, and it must be said without evidence, that this has led to massive vote fraud. And they tried to combat it by passing voter ID laws, opposing mail-in voting, and by many other measures. Those concerns are big drivers of many of the amendments now being proposed here in Pennsylvania. Some amendments would require voter IDs and repeal mail-in voting, restore to the legislature final authority to draw its own districts, create legislatively drawn districts for the election of judges again, and limit the veto powers and executive order powers of the governor, as well as the rulemaking powers of the courts. Now we can debate the merits of any and all of these constitutional amendments. But it's very hard for voters to learn about, much less to debate, the merits of all of them all at once. So the bottom line of my presentation is, although frequent state constitutional amendments can be a good thing, and approving them by referendums can be a good thing, we have to try to avoid the many ways that referendums can work against good popular decision making. And here in Pennsylvania, with all the proposed amendments that appear to be coming our way, we have to try right now to make sure our amending processes work well and work well for us all. All right, well, I think we're still on mute there, Judge. Thank you, thank you. There's something wrong with the screen, all right. Well, the three of you when presented, oh, the big picture, this is just me talking now. The big picture is two major umbrellas of problems, substantive and procedural. So the problems of substantive, when you look at the actual amendments, and I'm talking to our panel members, have you identified any particular amendments or groups of amendments that you find are troubling or perhaps even harmful? And I understand each of, each of you have different perspectives about the amendments, but, um, and many of the amendments are, uh, you know, there'll be three or four about the same subject matter. So although there are a lot in number, what do you folks think about the uh, substantive aspect of these uh, changes? Anyone can speak. 
Well, I would say that the, the one that bothers me the most, and it's kind of odd to say this, uh, Pennsylvania's for uh, modern courts, is the one that would take away the right to vote for judges statewide. Um, there have been a lot of proposals to move the system to appointment. Um, and, you know, it's funny that now the people who are in favor of appointment are suddenly in favor of statewide elections. But I think district voting for judges is extremely harmful. And not just because the legislature will gerrymander the districts, which is true, but rather it's the idea. And, and I find it odd that Republican leadership would want uh, geographic concerns to influence the meaning of law. I think I thought that they kept insisting in Washington that the law is the law and a judge's individual commitment shouldn't matter. As Justice Scalia used to say, just like there's no uh, you know, conservative way to make a hamburger and, and there's no Catholic way to be a judge. Um, and, and that should be the, the rule. I mean, the rule should be that uh, we do our best to interpret the constitution uh, through our whatever method we have of interpretation. But the idea that a rural interest would control and, and undoubtedly a justice on the Supreme Court elected from a rural area or an urban area would feel pressured to represent urban interests or rural interests. It's the worst of all worlds. And uh, that's the one, despite the fact that there are many other problems, that's the one that bothers me the most. And it's just revenge for a series of mostly ill-considered actions by the uh, pencil by the uh, democratic majority on the court but nevertheless it's a um, it's it's a bad piece of revenge well i'm the political scientist on the panel and so it may not be surprising that uh, i share certainly all those concerns um, i am particularly uh, worried about any and all amendments uh, that would make voting more difficult i do think we have um, uh, a nationwide battle to uh, uh, define eligibility for the franchise that's part of historic battles uh, in which, um, unfortunately, we have often made it harder to vote in America than it is in most modern democracies around the world. And we appear in danger of repeating um, uh, what I regard as a, a shameful history uh, of vote suppression. And so uh, the efforts to ratchet up uh, uh, demanding government issued ID requirements, the efforts to get rid of mail-in voting, uh, these are the things um, uh, that particularly concern me. And I, I would certainly agree with all of those things um, uh, that have been said so far. Uh, let me mention just a slightly, maybe more theoretical answer. Um, for me, as a matter of democracy, and I, I believe in democracy, and I don't know what it means exactly, and you know, I think voting is very, very important, but as a matter of democracy, I'm pretty open-minded about what Pennsylvania's government ought to look like. And I say again, you know, in 1776, there wasn't even a governor at all. And I think in some sense, if, um, if, if Pennsylvania, whatever that means to say, decided they didn't want a governor, I'm not sure why they'd want to do that kind of a thing, but I'm not categorically against that, um, you know, if that's what the people want. Uh, with that said, uh, an example, one example that I think is really troublesome uh, is this matching of a changing of the structure of government with the same match with these low turnout, low visibility um, elections. And very, very recently, uh, the uh, Constitution was changed to weaken the governor's emergency powers and the ability to respond quickly to emergencies. Now, I think that has to count for me as one of the most unfortunate and dangerous and damaging sorts of things that that if it's going to be undertaken it should be undertaken by pennsylvania as a whole with a lot of public energy the whole justification for having constitutional law is that's really not just the legislature act and they can write past statutes or whatever they want they have to go through a gubernatorial veto but the constitution is supposed to be like the public speaking as a whole and that's so wildly unrealistic in an election where tiny fractions of the public are speaking. That's where I think the, the instrument of constitutional amendment really feels perverse. So you combine that with a real weakening of an emergency power for the governor to respond to unforeseen crises in the future. 
I think that's really dangerous and damaging. And of course it happens, uh, as many people have mentioned, but I just want to make sure and highlight, uh, it turns out to be a very politically fractured uh, government between the General Assembly and, you know, at least some years, uh, the governor. And so these national politics, Professor Smith, national politics are playing their way out through this inner branch struggle. Um, and so to our um, struggles in Pennsylvania, which many people have referenced, I'm just putting sort of a, a label on it between local uh, decisions, including the gerrymandering of judges, which are designed to defeat statewide, which is to say urban and municipal voting power. Like that's what's at stake in Pennsylvania of decentralizing power is getting power away from big cities uh, and the state as a whole and focusing on local things. Now, again, I, I'm, look, I'm, a, I'm a Philadelphian, whatever you want, you know, but I, I'm not even against that necessarily. But I definitely think those kinds of transformations of the judicial branch, those kinds of transformation for sure of these really important voting rights, those sorts of weakening of emergency response by a governor to unforeseen crises. That's the kind of thing people really should be heard on and not sort of passed in the middle of an afternoon when nobody's paying attention. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to put in a, a, a word for the courts and not just the appellate courts, but there are several amendments which take away the Supreme Court's right to supervise the trial court level. And that, that to me is, is a, a huge mistake. Um, there's, there's also, uh, I think, two or three amendments proposed that, for example, family court, which is a, a large uh, division, certainly within Philadelphia, uh, where family court is going to be restructured and reimagined. And we have a, an amazingly uh, thoughtful, competent, strong leader, administrative judge, Terry Murphy in family court. She's put all sorts of programs, educational programs together and whatnot, which, well, now the legislature wants to take over family court, but they're not putting any money into family court, you know? And a lot of these amendments uh, relating to the courts, and again, I'll just stay in my lane, but relating to the courts, there's no sense that they're going to give money while they're re reimagining how the courts work. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has to maintain its rulemaking power, its administrative power over the trial courts and the appellate courts. And so, yes, I'm opposed to the redistricting of the appellate courts, you know, the voting as, as all of you have mentioned, but for the trial courts, it, we, the Supreme Court really has to be the, uh, the center that keeps everything going. Do any of you have any other particular amendments? Because now we've talked about substantive, I wanna move into procedural, which I think Professor Green sort of touched on, but procedurally, um, these, these amendments are in the dark of night. You know, we have a panel today uh, and I have to say thank you to Pennsylvania for Modern Courts because until I was uh, uh, tapped to be in this position, I, I didn't realize myself what was going on. You know, I knew that I, I was concerned about last May's uh, uh, amendments process to take away the emergency powers, but I didn't know about all these other things that were floating around. So what do you folks, the, three, the panel members, what do you think about you know, uh, amendments at the low turnout elections, amendments where no, there's even before the, the referendum, you know, the amendments, uh, nobody knows that they're on the, on the ballot until the day you get the, the ballot, if it's a mail-in ballot or you go to the polls. What do you think about that? Well, uh, can I respond? Uh, I want to defend the legislature to a certain extent in all these instances. Okay. Um, I want to ask Professor Smith if voter ID has really been shown to be a limit on voting where it's been enacted, which is widely. Um, I, I also want to note that it's the legislature, the Republican majority, that in 2019 adopted mail-in voting in the first place. I, I'd like to point out that the Emergency Act was uh, written to give the governor extremely broad powers uh, subject to a legislative veto. 
And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, overturned that and, and, and subjected that veto to a gubernatorial veto, which made no sense whatsoever. And that's what led to the amendment. And I'd also like to point out that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has on numerous occasions abused its rulemaking power, in, in particular by taking over disciplinary power over judges when the voters had specifically adopted an amendment to control discipline. I, I, I just wanna point out that in many of these instances, there are specific and defensible grounds for a lot of the amendments we've seen up to this point. Well, I'm happy to uh, respond because they're very fair questions. Uh, it's true that the empirical studies of uh, voter ID laws show only a mild vote suppression effect in most jurisdictions. Uh, they can actually have the effect of mobilizing voters to make extra efforts because they're angry at what they see as obstacles uh, to their voting. Uh, uh, my concern about them um, is not uh, primarily that they are effective in suppressing the vote, although any negative impact is a cause for concern. Uh, my concern is uh, that uh, they are being touted as necessary uh, to combat vote fraud uh, with no evidence that such vote fraud actually exists. And this casts an uh, uh, aura of illegitimacy on American elections uh, that can lead to uh, a disrespect and disregard for the results of election outcomes. And we have already seen the consequences of that kind of uh, dismissive uh, attitude uh, toward the legitimate results of democratic processes. It's pretty destructive. And I believe uh, that the rhetoric accompanying uh, the voter ID laws, the phony claims, frankly, of extensive vote fraud um, are even more damaging than the laws themselves. Um, I agree that Republicans have supported mail-in voting in many instances, uh, but they're now pushing back against it in many places, uh, including here in uh, Pennsylvania. Oregon has voted entirely by mail for many years now. No evidence of fraud, increases voter turnout, aids democracy. I don't see any reason to get rid of it. And then I think, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say my side of things is a, is a little bit more institutional. Not that I disagree, of course, in any way about the substance, for example, of the importance of voting rights and all the things that were mentioned there. But I think, again, sort of taking uh, taking Professor Ledowitz's point on its, as I understand to be its its merits, you know, good things and bad things. And I think uh, Professor Smith said the same thing that can be accomplished through a constitutional amendment. As it turns out, I'm somebody who cares about constitutional law, it turns out. And so my question about the whole thing is who's doing the lawmaking around this place? And so one vision of lawmaking is you elect uh, through their own decentralized and highly gerrymandered, but that's the way life goes, uh, a general assembly that in turn has mechanisms, not including a filibuster, not like the National Congress, uh, has the capacity to pass laws in the general assembly that they have to get past a governor in the state of Pennsylvania in the present era, uh, the governor and the, the General Assembly are from different parties. And so they don't agree on all the things. And that means that they have some limits on the ability to pass laws that reflect in that vision a certain fracturing of, I mean, again, there are very, a lot of footnotes here, but uh, a fractured politics in Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, fine, all those things. But the last thing that should be happening, the last thing should be happening is the idea of trying to accomplish some wide swath of transformative lawmaking outside the realm of ordinary political struggle in a world where you can't get past a gubernatorial veto and you can't elect a Republican governor. Instead, you go to a primary election and get everything done through a constitutional amendment. I think that's institutionally troublesome when it happens for good results or bad ones. That, that I think is the thing that I, and I, you know, I think that that's where I sort of come down about things. One could have a variety of opinions about uh, what the proper role of gubernatorial emergency response is. Uh, we could debate that all you want, but I think that that's the kind of thing. It's a very serious, I'll say it seems like a very serious issue to me today, it does.
And it's the kind of thing that if we are going to have Pennsylvania speaking on that subject, the Pennsylvania people speaking on that subject, uh, to borrow the phrase from Judge Messiah Jackson in the, in the dark of night, but of course it's really just one lazy afternoon uh, when the vast majority of people are focused on other things and there aren't political contests among candidates to focus the public mind on it. Of course, these amendments, I think, are not labeled as even supported by Republicans or Democrats. So even the sort of knee jerk background assumptions that people have about supporting Democrats and Republicans don't help. Uh, they don't help guide people in making those choices. Should I be voting yes or no or staying home and watching Netflix? And so I think these are the kinds of things that institutionally trouble me the most about this uh, about this instrument, but absolutely correct. And it's got to be given full credit. There are plenty of good statutes that can't get passed because of a split government, plenty. Uh, and there may in that environment be plenty of good things or bad things that could be accomplished through constitutional amendments. I just presumptively and institutionally, I'm just not really having it. And the only solution, which of course, a lot of folks are asking about in the chat, uh, you know, unfortunately is it would of course take a constitutional amendment to amend the amendment process which is another way of saying that in the lieu of that, we've all just got to keep talking about it as much as we can and drawing as much attention as we can, even though the structures are to be distractive and anti-democratic in some instances. Professor Letterwitz, you have a response? <laughs> well, I, I want to agree with Professor Green about the primary versus general election. I mean, that's, I, mean I, I agree absolutely that if it's going to be a referendum of the people of Pennsylvania, it should be at a general election. And I'm also unhappy about the way the amendment process is going forward without much in the way of hearings. And yes, know, unfortunate also. So there are I, a lot of, there, even though I agree with a number of the amendments uh, and I have a lot of uh, background with, with what's brought them about, um, the process issues are troublesome as uh, Professor so, Green says. So there are a lot of questions in the chat, right? About, you know, how do we make, our amendment process work well, right? I mean, there are proposals, but you know, should there be an overall, yes, an amendment to, to set forth a proper productive constitutional amendment process and what would that look like? Actually, I think it's a simple, a simpler way would be just say no. I mean, I, I really think there should be some money behind a campaign to end the abuse of the constitutional amendment process that just says, just say no. And, and if, they, if that were done in one election, it would change the momentum in Harrisburg. Well, there is talk also of having, you know, a vote that is, is not a majority, right? But a super majority, or there's talk of you know, while there's a, there's been our, there's there, somebody in the chat noted that, you know, there's a publication requirement, but yet, you know, our papers are going by the wayside and most young people don't read newspapers. Right, right. Okay, right. so should we, should that, you know, it, should that publication requirement be brought current? Well, you know, I, I agree with Professor Ledowitz that um, uh, our main emphasis should be uh, that voters have it in their hands to try to um, uh, keep this process from going awry by uh, rejecting constitutional amendments that um, uh, haven't uh, been properly uh, uh, deliberated and vetted and that do represent um, uh, legislation instead of constitution making. Uh, but it is true, there are a number of steps that could be taken uh, that could make the existing uh, process uh, better. Um, it, uh, we could uh, make sure that amendments take place in uh, general elections only. We could limit the number of constitutional amendments that are uh, put before the voters at any one time so that we could give more attention to them. And uh, the state government uh, could use uh, the great variety of media uh, that uh, people do pay attention to now and um, uh, try to make available views on all sides of the amendments that are uh, before the people uh, so that there could be more informed choices. Makes a lot of sense to me. And I think um, the one thing I would add, I think the reason that, and I mentioned this before, the reason that having whatever number of amendments happen in an actual election uh, 
with humans that are being elected in a controversial election is is because that has a way of focusing the public mind. And there are debates and there are a lot of news stories and there's a lot of public media, social media focused on races among parties and people. And the idea of having those conversations happen collateral with at the same time as amendments at least allows an elected official to use an amendment one way or the other uh, as something that's virtuous or something that's villainous. And so, of course, it's true, you know, everyone could just tune in to this Zoom call and then everything would be better. Um, but on the other hand, I think in a, in a world where those structures are working against and where this is another thing that many people have mentioned is where the General Assembly seems, uh, you know, for better or worse, what everyone thinks about it, but increasingly hardball or ruthless or relentless in using this device that's been around since 1835 in new kinds of ways. Um, all of the changes that anyone would, would contemplate, I think, um, that are likely to be most successful are either, you know, we all just wake up and spend more time on constitutional amendments, or the General Assembly has to be disciplined in some kind of a way from an outside force to give up this tool that they're finding especially useful. And that's the thing I think that some of the chat folks are, are mentioning in sort of the more critical and dismal elements is there is a sense in which we could all just be better citizens and more active citizens, but a lot of people are busy and they're not likely to become less so. And so I think that's where sort of the structural elements become a little bit more, um, a little bit more depressing. There's also a change that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court made um, very unfortunate um, over the bail amendment a few years ago. It, there had been a very strict requirement of a single, I don't know what to call it. The court went to what, what it called a single subject uh, requirement for amendments that you could have a lot of different choices as long as it was one subject. Prior to that, the court had insisted that, that in an amendment, there could be only one single yes or no answer to an amendment. And that if, if there could never be log rolling of any kind. And, and in the bail amendment, um, the denial of bail was extended on two different grounds. And um, uh, it, you know that would have violated the prior law in Pennsylvania, which was very exacting in how you write a, a constitutional amendment. Now, with the single subject rule, um, that really plays into the hands of anyone in the legislature who wants to pack one amendment with a lot of different stuff. There's been a number of, of questions, I guess, about the process um, or maybe some confusion. So I don't know if one of you wants to explain the process that currently exists in Pennsylvania because it, 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 it I'll, let, I'll leave it up to you because there's just definitely a lot of confusion in the chat. Well, I thought Professor Green explained uh, uh, accurately at the outset that um, uh, an amendment does have to be approved by both uh, chambers of the General Assembly uh, in two consecutive years and then it gets put on the ballot for the voters. But I guess that, and it has to be published, you know, in before the referendum, there's a certain number of days that it has to be published. Um, and, and it has to be published. The question actually has to be worded in a certain fashion. Uh, it has to be simple, which is always, you know, a question. It can't allegedly impact more than one part of the constitution. Um, so there are some, you know, additional, requirements with respect to the constitutional amendment process. Right, and that and that has led to a lot of litigation over the years. And most recently, the uh, uh, really outrageous uh, event that occurred with the, um, the uh, retirement age of judges in which an honest ballot question was overturned by the legislature and an un, a dishonest ballot question was substituted, which was affirmed by an equally divided court uh, at the Pennsylvania Supreme Court level. And that extension of the retirement age to 75 might very well have failed, uh, except that the uh, legislature insisted that the ballot question be worded as if we were imposing a retirement age for the first time, rather than extending it from 70 to 75. It was a really discouraging and disgraceful event in uh, Pennsylvania constitutional history. And, and who is responsible for drafting that word of the question? 
a secretary of state drafts under a very broad statute, but the uh, in that instance, the uh, legislature essentially held him hostage uh, and, and forced uh, him to agree to this, uh, her, I'm sorry, to agree to this uh, dishonest wording. And it was unbelievable. Uh, and uh, then it was defended as the act of the secretary of state. You know, it was, it was, it was like saying, you know, um, uh, uh, please stop me before I kill again. Uh, that's what was going on. I was going to say one very small technical thing is in terms of who publicizes that. I believe there's an amendment to change that because there was a failure to publicize something. But I wanted to make sure everybody understood the reason for the successive General Assembly uh, approvals in like, you know, a year or two years apart. And the idea there, I take it since 1835 is that, um, you know, something is not enough to get it passed one time, it's got to be passed two times. And that's supposed to fill in some of the deliberation and some of the sort of super majoritarian and this kind of a thing. It's just that in the modern context where the parties are pretty stably split between the General Assembly and the the idea of having two successive General Assemblies approve something really doesn't include that many more Pennsylvanian voters or that much of a larger swath of the Commonwealth because um, they're all operating outside of the, the gubernatorial veto. The governor has no say at all. And so, but it does slow things down. It has the opportunity for we Pennsylvaniacs to get more involved and to say things about it or whatever. But it also has sort of a slow moving train aspect where it becomes really hard to focus uh, that kind of attention, especially as everyone's been saying the whole time, especially where the actual decision for the public ends up happening when most of the public is doing other things. And so I think that's kind of the idea. Somebody had asked the question like, where does this idea sort of come from? It's the idea of slowing it down. And that in turn, obviously just one more thing is that's what makes me so concerned about crisis response because changing crisis response would then require similarly a relatively long period of time to change uh, the worst time you can try to have a slow moving process but that may be a former government attorney talking so maybe that's too personal politics i'm not sure no, but you know, it, used, it used to work very well um the the two successive terms i'm i'm thinking in particular of the constant efforts to to uh, head off um, an amendment to define marriage in pennsylvania as between a man and a woman uh, it passed several times in one session and was defeated or it's essentially blocked the second time each time. Maybe as Professor Green says, it doesn't work as well today, but it used to work, I think, very well. And I think the other, the other uh, thing I wonder is, was, wasn't there more turnover in the General Assembly, right? In the past, I don't, I, I don't know if anybody studied that in connection with this. There used to be more lawyers in the General Assembly. Uh, I mean, I worked with the State Senate for two years, but back in the 70s and 80s, there, we used to have lawyers who helped frame some of these uh, issues. Now that they're not there. And uh, I think that also makes a difference. This would be the first time a problem could be addressed by having more lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have, to, I have to note, too, that um, uh, mostly in regard to legislation, but even in regard to some of these constitutional changes, uh, there are national organizations that are providing texts to um, uh, legislators, including here um, in Pennsylvania. And so uh, there are definitely lawyers involved in crafting them. They're often uh, part of pretty partisan advocacy organizations. Yeah, yeah. Well, I look at the, and I, and I am a nonpartisan organization, <laughs> But I look at the composition of the Judiciary Committee for the House, and there are, you know, a de minimis, there's I think four, you know, maybe five lawyers on that committee. And, you know, as, as the judge says, you know, there aren't, the head of that committee is not a lawyer. So there are concerns about, you know, not having lawyers as part of a Judiciary Committee, right? I mean, who knows what a judge? Who knows what a judge does if you're not a lawyer getting reprimanded by a judge? Sorry, Your Honor. <laughs> and and there was one other thing which I think has been on the sidelines of some of our discussion in terms of thinking about how these things can change the rule of law. And I think Professor Ledowitz was mentioning sort of a geographic fracturing 
um, and sort of thinking of laws shattered into little bitty districts over here and over there. And uh, and I also just also wanted to say that if you think about over, I mean, people can have their own views about the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, who themselves are elected, um, but uh, one can have one own view about Pennsylvania Supreme Court. But I think that especially if you think of the the the, the minor um, democratic input. Uh, constitutional amendments is that the kind of thing that should be overturning Pennsylvania Supreme Court opinions? You know what kind of a threat to the rule of law is that also? So I think um, you know I think there are a lot you know a lot of things. Um, not to say anything about, of course, there can be perfectly righteous good things that can be done and bad through Supreme Court decisions, through lower court decisions, through uh, legislation, through uh, governor's executive orders and demands for emergency and all this kind of stuff. There, there are lots of, and, and, and constitutional amendments, lots of good and things, bad things that can be done. But I, I really think that in this world of increasingly nationalized networks of, of uh, policy agendas, I think that's, that's also true. And, and a re I just think, again, this is, this is my perception of American politics as a non-political scientist. Um, I think the era of hardball is here. I think, you know, whether you think of lawyers as a mitigating force or you think of a certain kind of middle ground, if that's the right kind of thing to say, or I think, I think in that realm, uh, some of the margins and some of the, uh, I think the chat had referred to as ruthlessness and relentlessness and thereby potentially democratic and anti-legal abuse of this instrument that absolutely could function uh, in good and bad ways. But I think there are new threats created by some set of relatively modern uh, circumstances. But some of those threats, those partisan threats also come from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And I'm thinking in particular of the disgraceful rush to judgment over the 2018 congressional voting district where there was not enough time or weeks were given to the lower court to change that map just so it would help turn the uh, federal house of representatives blue. That's how it seemed to me. And I'm a long-term Democrat who has never voted for a Republican except perhaps by accident, um, but it seemed completely partisan to me. And uh, so I don't think all the threats come from the legislature. No, unfortunately, we have a, a intense partisan polarization that is uh, infecting all parts of American governance today. And uh, um, as Professor Green said, um, uh, it does uh, mean some often ruthless hardball politics uh, that we see from the different uh, branches. Uh, one of our greatest challenges, I think, is to um, uh, recognize that while we do have severe differences on many policy issues, uh, there are many aspects of um, American constitutional democracy uh, that represent common ground, that people in both parties, um, uh, I think voters in both parties, uh, do really um, uh, believe in and support. I think we need a politics that um, calls attention to our common ground more than to our uh, partisan differences, uh, but that is um, uh, also why I'm concerned uh, that we have a partisan uh, politics uh, that um, delegitimates our um, admittedly problematic institutions, often in ways that go uh, far beyond what um, uh, reality justifies. So I think um, uh, we do need to um, uh, defend the aspects of our system uh, that do work well and work well according to values shared by uh, uh, people in uh, both parties. Um, uh, I think it is unfortunate uh, that uh, we've assailed uh, the many election officials, for example, uh, who did a, a heroic job of conducting election under pandemic uh, conditions. And this is something uh, that uh, was a, a triumph of American democratic institutions that ought to be a source of common celebration. I agree. I think that's a great way to end this program. Um, I know we are a few minutes shy, but the chat conversation has been amazing. Um, and, and it's really encouraging, honestly, to see so many people interested in this constitutional amendment process in Pennsylvania and in general. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you for our professors for, for engaging.
in this conversation and frank discussion. Thank you, Judge Jackson, for, for leading us down this path, I will say. And um, this has been a, a great evening. And again, you know, spot, I put in the chat um, a Spotlight PA link because it's keeping track of the constitutional amendments that are, that are, um, that are being brought forward. Uh, right now, the only one that has, I would like to say, passed twice has been published and is ripe, but I'm hoping it, you know, it gets overripe and just disintegrates into the ground, is uh, House Bill 38, the judicial gerrymandering, which uh, Pennsylvania for Modern Courts and the others on this phone actually were, had created a coalition called JIPA um, to, to fight against. So again, everybody, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we will be, I'm sure we will have more programs like this. So stay tuned.